So this is uh, the book of Hebrews. That's what we're going to be studying, the book of Hebrews. The Glorious Jesus is the subtitle, because the uh, book of Hebrews absolutely, absolutely presents Jesus as the glorious one. And of course, this is the first lesson in this series, and uh, we're going to do uh, uh, what's usually called a critical introduction. A lot of times I skip over this and I get right to the text, but we're going to take uh, at least one lesson to uh, give a critical introduction, give some background information, you know, the why, where, when, what type thing uh, concerning this book. Well, let's start with the idea that the first Christians, the first congregation, the first scriptures used to prove Christ was the Messiah uh, was, of course, the, the Hebrew scriptures. You know, what we call the Old Testament. It took, uh, if you think about it, if you, if you do a timeline, it took about 10 years for the apostles to preach the gospel to non-Jews. A decade went by. They were only preaching to the Jews. 10 years goes by before you know, Peter is called. And by the way, that's not because they were slackers or they refused. You know, they, were, they were thinking they're preaching the gospel to all the Jews in the world until you know, Peter has this apparition in Acts chapter 10 and, and, and he goes to see Cornelius and Peter understands, oh, you mean you want the gospel preached to everybody in the world, including the Gentiles. That took a decade. Now in the first 30 years of Christianity, you could be a Hebrew Christian and still practice your Jewish faith and traditions because the two religions were seen as different forms of the same thing. Eventually, however, this became more difficult for a variety of reasons. First of all, the Jewish religion became more openly hostile towards Christianity. You know, at first it was, well, you know, there's this sect here, there's this, these people, this offshoot of Judaism, and they're you know, troublemakers, and so on and so forth, but it was still part of you know, the Jewish um, religion. But uh, eventually the Jews began to uh, seriously uh, harass uh, the Christians. Uh, we know that simply by uh, looking at the life of Paul or Saul. Uh, first glimpse we get of Saul is uh, he's holding the coats of the individuals that are, that are killing uh, Stephen, the Christian. Another reason is that um, um, the conservative Jewish Christians of the time wanted to keep Christianity within the context and the control of the Jewish religion. Okay? Another reason why it was difficult at the beginning. You know, the Judaizers, right? Basically we're saying you had to become a Jew first before you became a Christian. The big argument over circumcision wasn't circumcising the Jews, it was circumcising the Gentiles. If a Gentile wanted to be a Christian, he had to be circumcised and keep all the Jewish laws and so on and so forth. And then thirdly, a uh, Roman persecution began. Um, and the Romans began making a distinction between the two religions. Originally, the, the Romans had seen Christianity as simply a sect of Judaism. And that was significant because in the Roman Empire at the time, Judaism was a legal religion. You were allowed to practice Judaism, but not other religions. They didn't get permission. And so when Christianity, began, when the Romans began to see Christianity as a religion apart from Judaism, then the persecution, that's not the only reason, but at least it, it, it enabled them to say, by law, you people are breaking the law. And um, the, um, uh, the persecution of uh, Christianity began. Um, and we see that, of course, uh, Paul's imprisonment, so on and so forth. Second Timothy 4, 6, we, uh, we find out that Paul you know, is, uh, is looking uh, towards being executed by the, by the Romans. So because of these pressures, many Jewish Christians were faced with the decision to return to their old religion or to make a complete break in order to embrace Christianity fully. See what I'm saying? Well, there's an overlap time there, especially in the book of Acts, there's an overlap time. And during that overlap time, you know, up to 70 AD, 
you could be a Jew and you could be a Christian at the same time, you can kind of get it both ways. But eventually you had to pick, all right? You, you couldn't, you, know, you had to pick. And so the Jewish Christians could no longer have it both ways, as I said. And so the letter to the Hebrews was written to convince them that they had made the right decision in the first place and they should persevere in the Christian faith. We read about that in Hebrews 6.1. So the title of this letter is To the Hebrews, that's the full title. It was not written as a general epistle to all Jews. I mean, it could be used this way, but it was not originally written this way. It was aimed at a specific group um, that the author was planning to visit. And we'll read about that in Hebrews 13, actually, at the end. Uh, there's no definitive proof, but several, there are several theories as to who wrote this epistle, because uh, the author does not name himself. So it's an unknown writer, like I say, uh, an individual who certainly knew Paul's writings and wrote this letter using Paul's writings as source material, but doesn't name himself. So there are some scholars that say, well, we don't know, we'll never know. Others say it could have been Barnabas. Uh, and there are good arguments for Barnabas being the author of Hebrews. He was a Levite, Acts 4.36. And so he was familiar with Jewish ritual, Old Testament customs. Uh, he wrote Greek since he came from Cyprus. Uh, he was not known, however, for his scholarity. He was kind of a man of action. And uh, this epistle, according to Greek scholars, has a very high quality of language, very high level of writing. Uh, others think perhaps Apollos, may have been the writer. He was a Greek scholar from Alexandria. He was an orator. He was well versed in the Old Testament, also well versed in Paul's writings. He was well known in the church, respected by the other apostles. Um, I guess the case against him is, again, he doesn't name himself, and also there are no other writings that exist from his hand. So this is kind of a major you know, piece of work here without any other writings accredited to him. And then of course, popular theory, Paul, the apostle himself wrote it. He was familiar obviously with the Old Testament, with the gospel. He may have first written it as a sermon. There are a lot of references that suggest that this was originally an oral presentation. It wasn't originally designed to be a written letter, but it was an oral presentation that then was written down. Uh, all early church fathers concluded that it was written by Paul, actually. Clement, um, 150 to 215, uh, Origen, 185 to 254, Jerome, 347 to 420. These are some of the early church fathers who claimed that Paul was the author. So the best guess or the best theory is that it was originally written by Paul as a sermon and then later translated into Greek by Luke during or after Paul's death in Rome in 67 AD. Now what we know for sure is that the writer knew his readers and their circumstances. The author also knew Timothy. He was well versed in the Old Testament, also in temple ritual. Um, he, was, uh, he fully grasped the knowledge of who Christ was and he was an excellent writer. We know about that. But as Origen said, after his study of the question of uh, who wrote this in the second century, he said, but who wrote the epistle? And I quote, only God knows certainly. So we, you know, I'm giving you the theories. You, know, you pick one. You know, we, don't, we don't know for sure. But those are the theories that are out there. When was it written? An interesting idea. 96 AD, uh, Clement, who was the bishop of, a bishop of Rome, quotes from Hebrews. So it's definitely before 96 AD, because in 96 AD we have a, a church leader quoting from Hebrews, so we know it wasn't written after 96 AD. Um, in 70 AD we know that uh, the city of Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by a Roman army, and since Hebrews deals with temple ritual at length, the fact that this event is not mentioned at all in the epistle strongly suggests that it was written before 70 AD. 
And also, when the writer of Hebrews is talking about the work of the priests, he talks about it in the present tense. And so this suggests, boy, if a, if a cataclysmic thing like the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem and its people and all that had happened, surely somebody who's writing about the temple, if he's writing after 70 AD, would have some mention of it somehow, but there's nothing there. So scholars believe it's certain, you know, it's before 70 AD. Uh, 33 to 60 AD, in Hebrews 2, 3 and 4, and 13, 7, the writer speaks of leaders in the church and those who have given leadership examples and passed on, you know, passed on through death. Uh, these references suggest that at least a generation, maybe even two generations, have taken place since the initial establishment of the church in Jerusalem. So it's, it's got to be later than 33, right? And he's suggesting that there's a, a fully formed leadership in the church. And so that, that didn't happen at the beginning. There were no elders, you know, there were only apostles at the beginning. The church evolved and developed and began to have a structure of elders and deacons. And so his references to elders that have died and gone on means that, okay, he must be writing you know, at least a generation or two after 33. So most scholars, uh, put the writing of this between 63 and 69 AD because the temple is still standing and functioning and there's been time for a few generations of Christian leaders to have been developed in the church. So there's a little background on who wrote it, why, and so on and so forth. Uh, or rather, uh, when it was written. The purpose and the approach of Hebrews, the purpose is encouragement, encouragement. In Hebrews 13, 22, he says, but I urge you, brethren, bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. I'm writing to encourage you. So the purpose is encouragement. But encouragement for what? Well, to encourage Jewish Christians who were wavering in their faith and contemplating a return to Judaism, an encouragement to remain faithful to Christ. They were discouraged by persecution. They were discouraged because they had to choose. I mean, imagine, I mean, you grow up as a Jew, it's not just a religion, it's your whole way of life. You have to choose between that and then this other religion that's being persecuted. So a difficult, a difficult choice. Also, uh, some of the people he's writing to had begun to neglect the assembly. He writes about that. And of course, that's always the first sign of spiritual illness. People stop coming to worship the Lord. Uh, many of them had returned to Judaism. He mentions that in Hebrews 6. And it was also becoming clear that the Jewish nation was not going to embrace Christianity. See, early Christians thought, you know, we just have to stay at it. We just have to give the message. We, we, we just keep on calling out to our Jewish brethren and eventually they'll get it. You know, why, why, what is it they don't get? Jesus was a Jew, he fulfilled the prophecies, we got the miracles, we got the resurrection. You know, eventually they'll, they'll come over. But two, three, four decades later, they still haven't come over. They began thinking to themselves, okay, this is a lost cause. And I would say that if you were a Jew, a Jewish Christian, the thought that Gentiles were going to become the majority in the church Right? I mean, we have that happen in our congregation, in every congregation. You have a congregation of you know, a certain culture, let's just say. And then all of a sudden, another culture begins to move into the area, whatever that is. And you see eventually you know, one culture displaced by another. Well, that's what they were afraid of. They shouldn't be, we're all one in Christ. But remember, this was, this was new to them. And of course, Jewish Christians were going to be isolated. They didn't fit in with the Gentiles and they were rejected by their Jewish family. Talk about isolation. And remember now, the Jews, they had the temple, they had the priests with the beautiful garments and the jewels and, they, and, and the pomp and the ceremony and the history and the prestige and the high priest and, and, and all the characters, David and Solomon, you know, they had all of that. And what did the Christians have? 
Well, they were meeting in the upper room or they were meeting in catacombs or they were meeting in basements, they were meeting in houses, they had no money, no power, no prestige, no influence. And their Lord, according to the, what people saw, ha had been executed as a criminal. So you know, it's like when they were going, uh, whoa, wait a minute, which way should I go here? Especially on the high holy days, especially when uh, there were the feasts, right? So they had to choose. So the writer, so how do you talk to these people? So the writer compares the two religions and he challenges his readers to choose once and for all which religion is superior. In the epistle he compares Jesus to various important features of the Jewish religion. He compares Jesus to the prophets, to the angels, to Moses, to Joshua, to Aaron, who represents the Jewish religion and Jewish worship. And once he gets to the comparison of Christ and Aaron, he leaves off the comparison between persons, and then he begins to compare the effectiveness of the Aaronic priesthood versus the effectiveness of the priesthood of Christ. And this is because the ministry of the priesthood, you know, this was the heart and soul of the Jewish religion. The point being that the work of Jesus as high priest was superior to the work of Aaron and his descendants as high priest. Therefore, Christianity was superior to Judaism. You know, when people say, oh, it's not polite you know, to compare religions and you shouldn't say a bad thing about another religion. Well, you know what? The whole book of Hebrews is comparing religions and showing the superiority of one religion over the other. So once he finishes his series of comparisons and arguments, the author lists a number of heroes who were persecuted and suffered for their faith, but they persevered. And he does this as an encouragement to his readers to do the same thing. And he finishes the epistle with practical teaching about how to live faithfully from day to day as a Christian and as a member of the church and then he finishes with greetings and exhortations. So I've just given you a real quick overview of what's going on here. Now Hebrews is divided, it's the easy book to divide. It's divided into two parts. Part one, the glory of Christ. Chapter one, verse one, to chapter 10, verse 18. See, the Jewish people were used to the concept that God revealed Himself through various ways and people and angels and religious rites you know, temple worship, sacrificial system, so on and so forth. And God glorified Himself and His people through these ways, and this interaction with His people for which they took confidence in and gave praise for, they were all about it. So in the first part of Hebrews, the writer demonstrates that no matter how glorious these things were, the revelation or the uncovering that we receive of God through Jesus is far superior. In other words, if you think you knew God through the prophets and through the sacrificial system and through the law, if you think you knew God through those things, those things are nothing compared to how you will know God through Jesus Christ. Okay? So in the first 10 chapters, the writer demonstrates how Jesus is more glorious than the prophets, the angels, Moses, so on and so forth, and thus superior and worthy to be followed and worthy to be obeyed. So that's the first half. The next part, just two parts, the glory of the church. Chapter 10, 19 to chapter 13, 25. So once he's established the supremacy of Christ by demonstrating his greater glory, the author encourages the church to glorify its head Jesus by faithfulness to him and holiness in him. And then the conclusion left unsaid is that if Jesus is more glorious than the Jewish religion, including its prophets and rituals, so on and so forth, then his church shares in that glory and is therefore superior also. And his message is do not abandon the greater for the lesser. Don't do that. Okay, so let's do a little bit of text tonight. Jesus greater than the prophets. Let's begin chapter one, verse one. So God, after He spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many ways, um, and portions, and excuse me, uh, spoke, uh, fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, Hebrews one, verse one. 
So God spoke. God spoke, He was speaking. It was personal, it was conscious, it was communication. The fathers were the various people, the leaders, the kings to whom God addressed Himself in the history of the Jews. That's who the fathers were. Then he says, in the prophets. In other words, God was speaking when they spoke. They were the greatest single source of revelation. The prophets were. That's what the Hebrew writer is saying. I mean, the prophets equal the Old Testament. They're the ones that did the revealing. And then he says, in many ways and portions. In other words, he spoke through them, but in different ways. Sometimes through dreams or visions, writings. Sometimes the warnings were immediate. Sometimes the warnings were for something that would happen you know, far down the road. Keep going, in verse two he says, in these last days, again, Hebrews 1, 2, in these last days. Last days refers to the last phase of human history according to biblical chronology. So there are three phases. Number one, there is the antediluvian phase, that is from the creation to the flood. Genesis 1, verse 1 to Genesis 8, 22. That's the antediluvian, before the flood. The second uh, era is post-diluvian, meaning after the flood. That's from the rainbow until the ascension of Christ. Genesis 9, 1 to Acts chapter 1, verse 26. It begins and ends with men's eyes looking towards the sky in hope. They look towards the sky and see the rainbow in hope. And that period, that post-diluvian period, ends with the apostles looking up to the sky, seeing Jesus ascend in hope. And then the third period is, or are the last days. The last days, Pentecost until the second coming of Christ. Acts chapter two, all the way to Revelation 22. The time that the church has been given the task to prepare the world for the return of Christ. We are in the last days. Okay, I saw a newspaper ad, where was it? I think it was in the local paper, the Choctaw paper. And they were having a big meeting, a big religious meeting. And one of the quote prophets of a, a church here in town was having a big meeting and he was going to explain the last days and make references to some of the political events taking place and some of the you know, wars that are going on. He was going to pinpoint you know, the I mean, preachers have been doing that for like, I, as long as I can remember, there's always somebody coming along telling us, oh, we're at the end now. Yeah, we don't know. But we are in the last days. And what are we supposed to be doing? We're preparing the world for the second coming of Christ, should He come in our generation. He could, and that's what our task is. So in this last time, the writer says, God has spoken through His Son, not the prophets or in other various ways. This is the communication method from God in the last times. So we're in the last times, right? From Pentecost to the second coming. So from Pentecost till the time Jesus returns, how does God communicate with us? Well, through Jesus, through His word. So the revelation that He makes through His Son in these last times is greater, the author says, than anything that had ever come from the prophets. Yes, He spoke to the prophets in diverse ways and manners, and yes, they provided a portion of revelation of, of God and His will. But in these last times, God is revealing Himself through Jesus. And the rev revelation is much broader and much deeper and much clearer. So the revelation that He makes through His Son in these last times, as I say, is greater than anything that had ever come from the prophets. So now the writer isn't saying that God didn't speak through the prophets, He did but Jesus was the person that they were speaking about. 
The writer goes on to list three things about the Son that demonstrates His superiority over the prophets. First of all, He is preeminent in history. Verse two, it says, in these last days He has spoken to us in His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the world. So an heir is the one who inherits something left to him by somebody else. Usually the thing left has been you know, gathered or built by one person and then left to another person to inherit. So the writer here notes that Jesus is the inheritor of all things because through Him all things were created. Now that's not a new idea in the New Testament. You know, Matthew talks about this in Matthew 28, you know, all authority in heaven on earth you know, has been given unto me. In John 1.3, 1 Corinthians 8, Colossians 1, Revelation 1, 8, you know, where Jesus said, I am the Alpha and I am the Omega, I'm the beginning and the end. So what the writer is saying here about Jesus is that He has a preeminent place in history because, listen up, because He is both at the beginning of history as the agent of creation and He is at the end of history as the inheritor of everything. So He is the rightful owner in place of Satan who tried to displace Him by seducing mankind. So how is Jesus preeminent in history? Well, He's there at the beginning because through Him the world was created and He's there at the end when all of it is wrapped up and, and goes back to a unified uh, Godhead with man now included in the, in the Godhead. So the prophets, you know, they reminded the Jews of their past and they spoke of the future. But Jesus is greater than they because He is both at the beginning and the end of time. The prophets only lived in between the beginning and the end of time. So that's one thing, his preeminence in history. Remember I said three things that demonstrate his superiority. One, his preeminence in history. Two, whoops, sorry. Two, his person. Verse 3a, um, uh, hang on, let's see. Verse 3a, it says, and he is the radiance uh, of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. So in discussing the personhood of Jesus, the author says three things about Him which no one could ever say about any of the prophets. One, He's the radiance of His glory. Radiance equals a bright light. Glory is source or essence of God. So Jesus is light from the source, not reflected light like the moon. He's like the sun. He gives off light. He's the source of light. So we know in the Old Testament, you know, Moses, when he went up on the mountain to be with God, when he came down, his face was shining. Why? Because the radiance of God reflected off of him. Well, Jesus' radiance in relationship to God is what flames are to a fire, what sunlight is to the sun. We see this radiance in practical ways in His teaching and miracles and His pure life. We see it in supernatural ways, you know, the transfiguration, you know, His clothes became bright and so on. We see it in the transfiguration. We see it in the ascension. So the prophets saw and spoke of this radiance, but Jesus was the radiance. Without Jesus, the world is in complete darkness when it comes to God and salvation. What does He say? I am the light of the world. No prophet ever said, I am the light of the world. And then secondly, He's the exact representation of God's nature. Now, some translations say He is the imprint of God's nature or the stamp of God's nature. The idea here is that Jesus isn't a copy of God, it's that He shares the nature of God. For example, uh, men and dogs uh, both breathe, <laughs> they have eyes. Both men and dogs reproduce, but they don't have the same nature. They are alike in many ways, but they don't share the same human nature, right? Well, Jesus isn't just like God, He's not a caricature of God, 
he shares the same nature. We could say, for example, men and women, they're different persons, but they share the same nature, a human nature. So when we see Jesus, we see the nature of God, love, justice, intelligence, will, power. And so the prophets, you know, they did supernatural things by the power of God, but all of them possessed a human nature. Jesus, on the other hand, did supernatural things because He possessed both a human and a divine nature. Again, I'm just reiterating the argument over and over again that the Hebrew writer makes in the first chapter, Jesus greater than the prophets. And in this sense, a greater nature than the prophets, a divine nature. And then thirdly, He upholds all things, it says, by the word of His power. In other words, uphold here doesn't mean holding like, you know, Atlas, you know, you have pictures of Atlas, you know, and he's like this, and he's, he's holding the, the world you know, on his shoulders, right? Okay, not like that, he doesn't, that's not the image here that the writer is talking about, that he upholds all things. It means that his power holds everything together so that nothing is allowed to destroy totally the world. That's why I'm not really worried about man destroying the world. Man pollutes the world, yes. Man exploits the world, yes but it is not in the power of man to destroy the world, even if he wanted to, even if he tried to. That power is exclusively belonging to, to God. It also means that he guides the world to its end according to his purpose. And he cannot be overtaken in his purpose. So all of this is done how? Well, it's done by the word of His power. In other words, the way that He expresses His will is through His word. For example, in the beginning, the will of God said, let there be light, and light appeared. No fuss, no strain. This was Christ's role in creation. He was the word. He was the agent through which the mind of God brought into existence the physical universe. Right? That's why it's so amazing when John says, and the word, that agent that you know, brings into being the reality that we live in, that word became flesh. So when in the boat, when the Lord's in the boat, during the storm, He calmed the sea. How? A word? Be still. A word. To the crippled man in the temple, he offered forgiveness with just his word. And then to prove that he had the power to do this, he healed him. How? With his word. No jumping up and down, no, you know, like you see the faith healers on TV. So let's make sure we, we stick to our point here. The prophets, they did many great things, but the words that they spoke, they weren't their words, they were his words. And the things that they did, they were done through His will. So Jesus was greater than the prophets because first, He was before them and after them. Second, His personhood reflected God's image and will and power. And finally, His position was greater than their position. So let's talk about His position, right? In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So the author describes two positions that Jesus took that no prophet ever took. First of all, the lowest position. He took the lowest position. Sacrifice for sin. That was the lowest position. Jesus could have expressed his preeminence and personhood without leaving heaven, but he did so in order to deal with man's sins. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to, um, uh, where am I? Phil, um, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. I said if we'd have time, I would, I would read that. It says, who although he existed in the form of God, the speaking of Jesus, 
did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so when we're talking about his position, we first of all talk about him taking the very lowest position, the one of slave, the one who would be crucified. Now this reference to purification from sin is explained further on as the author goes you know, into more detail about the manner and the reasons why all of this had to be done. But for now, he simply mentions that Jesus did this. So as far as his position is concerned, he began by taking the lowest position. And then he also occupies the highest position at the right hand of God, authority. Philippians 2.8 explains that Jesus returned to reclaim the position of authority he occupied before his humiliation on the cross. Now it's interesting to note that Jesus is the first and the last in a horizontal time frame, right? And he occupies the top and the bottom roles in a vertical position, right? He's first, he's last. He's on the bottom, he's also on the top. Some people say, why do you have a cross back there? Because it, <laughs> it, it, it's so significant of the Christian religion, every, every aspect of it. And so in comparison to the prophets, well the prophets, you know, they offered sacrifice for sin, but they never offered themselves a sacrifice. And none of the prophets had authority, save what authority they received from God. Most of them actually tried to run away. Jesus, however, gives authority from His position of power at the right hand of God. Okay, so I'm going to stop just those first three verses. So the author begins his letter by exalting Jesus. And he says that he is greater than the prophets because he is the first and last in history. The prophets, they lived in between the first and last. He is divine in nature. The prophets are only human in nature. He is supreme in authority. And the prophets have no authority. No, no prophet could or ever did claim any of these things. So there's really only one you know, kind of main lesson here, uh, and I'll try in the book of Hebrews you know, to kind of pull out some lessons, just practical lessons for us, but there's really only one lesson or application based on our study of just the first three uh, verses, and that is listen to Jesus, <laughs> listen to Him. At the transfiguration, the voice in the cloud, what did it say? This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him, listen to Him. He is greater than the prophets of Israel and they were greater than any of the prophets of their day or our day because what they said about Him came true. Jesus by His position historically, first and last, and spiritually, lowest and highest, has the right and the authority to speak as and for God. So when our faith is weak and when we're searching for answers, when we're troubled or discouraged, what we need is not, you know, I need more time alone. <laughs> I need more alone time. I need a vacation. I need a break from the church. You know, what my wife tells me when I'm getting a little too difficult, <laughs> she says to me, you need more of Jesus. That's the code word that you need to get your book and go into your corner and read or go to your bedroom and pray. But what you need is you need more of the Lord because what's happening is you've got a Jesus deficiency going on and that's showing itself in discouragement and anger and you know what I'm saying, you're not your spiritual self. You're not the person you're meant to be in Christ. Well, the only remedy to that is not you know, ice cream. Uh, I've tried that route. It's, <laughs> it's very good, but it doesn't solve the spiritual problem. The intake we need is we need more of Him, more, more of the Lord. And so to a church on the brinks of collapse, 
the author begins his letter without even an introduction, but he gives them first and foremost the life-sustaining words about Jesus Christ. And I think we ought to remember this when we're in the same type of position. Okay, so that's our inter introductory lesson to Hebrews. I hope you're getting something out of it. I guarantee you, you will get a lot out of this uh, study. We're going to go deep and we're going to do it line by line. All right, we are dismissed, thank you.